I'm honored to begin this um, this workshop, and <clears throat> especially I'm honored to um, to dedicate my lecture to the memory of Walter Craig. Uh, we were at Brown together. We were the two Walters <laughs> when we were at Brown, um, and he loved water waves. He absolutely loved water waves. This is a talk about water waves, a very about a very classical subject, and I want to. <clears throat> and what I'm talking about is one theorem uh, which solves a, a classical problem and it's it's joint work with Hui Nguyen who is a postdoc at Brown. Um, okay so now I'm gonna start. Oops. There we go. Okay so a Stokes wave. Um, yeah so Stokes wave is a is a is a water wave which i'll be more specific in a moment and um it's traveling in a fixed direction and and for us it's a periodic periodic in the horizontal variable <clears throat> and when one perturbs um a stokes wave by a by a slightly different wave number so that you get a time dependent problem, then the wave will seriously deviate from the original Stokes wave. Um, this, is, this is what we call the modulational instability, often called the Benjamin Fear instability. Oh, okay, so here's a little picture of, a cute little picture of a nice two dimensional water wave. We're gonna assume that the water is incompressible, two-dimensional, like in this picture, and irrotational and inviscid. <clears throat> so it'll be described by the Euler equations. And there is a free boundary between the water and the air, which is what makes it interesting. And um, we just make two assumptions, which go back 200 years. Um, one is that the pressure on the surface is the same as the air pressure, constant. And the other thing is the particles on the surface remain on the surface. So here's a little sketch of just a, a rough sketch of a periodic wave with period L, gravity points downwards. It's two dimensional and it's periodic on the horizontal variable. The surface is given by a function eta and the bottom is flat. So you have um, traveling waves. Okay, so specifically, just look at the uh, equations one. Um, we, we define, because, because it's irrotational as well as incompressible, the, the velocity potential is harmonic. And so that's phi. So the gradient of phi is the velocity. And in the fluid domain, you have a harmonic function. And then you have on the bottom, we will assume infinite depth for the purpose of this talk. So at infinite depth, it becomes very quiet. Nothing happens, the velocity goes to zero. And on the surface, which is the main deal, um, the, fir the first equation, this one, says that the pressure is constant on the surface. <coughs> P is atmospheric pressure. And the second equation says that um, that particles on the surface remain on the surface. This is totally standard and probably goes back almost 200 years. Uh, Stokes waves, <clears throat> it was um, in around 1850 that Stokes himself uh, started um, analyzing this and he looked at waves of small amplitude, which is what we will also start with. And then he, then he wrote down a power series in the amplitude A. <clears throat> and it wasn't, but it wasn't until many years later, uh, which was 100 years ago, that Nekrasov and Levi Civita independently uh, proved that the power series converges. And therefore, you actually have the existence of these waves, which we call Stokes waves. So are these waves stable? 
So when there was evidence, there was numerical experimental evidence that there were certain, there were instabilities even in a, in a periodic wave, but it wasn't until 1967 <clears throat> that Benjamin and Fear wrote a paper which really explained what was going on, but it was somewhat heuristic. And there were, there were also important um, contributions from Lighthill and Whitham uh, at about the same time. Um, so, so he, okay, so as I said before, you change the wave number a little bit and you get a kind of resonance. <clears throat> and that's the instability, that leads to the instability. So I'll be more specific in a moment. Um, the next, from the point of view of this talk, the really important paper <clears throat> is by Bridges and Milken in 1995, where they finally gave a rigorous proof of the linear of the linearized stability, this kind of stability, by means of spatial dynamics. And the purpose of my talk is to talk about is to mention <clears throat> uh, to announce a new proof that's different from theirs that also works for infinite depth, um, as I'll say in a moment. Now that there are there's a lot of work on approximate models of waterways going by, way back to like into the 19th, certainly into the 19th century. <clears throat> but specifically in the last 15 years, there have been, uh, there have been proofs of the modulational instability for various approximate models. These approximate models are like KDV, NLS, Widom equation and so on. So people involved in that, there are a whole bunch of papers, Bronsky, Gallet, Haragus, Herr, Johnson, Capitula, and Pandy. Uh, and, um, and there's a very interesting paper very much more recently by Jin Liao and Ji Wu Lin, um, which which discusses, which proves the nonlinear instability of many of these models. So our work does, um, takes a lot of, uh, we get a lot of uh, information and ideas from all the people that I've just mentioned. <clears throat> but we are talking here about the full water wave problem, uh, not the approximations. <clears throat> And so to compare with Bridges and Milka, they use spatial dynamics, but their method does not work because of the continuous spectrum if, if you have infinite depth. So we give a proof that it works for both finite or infinite depth. Although in this talk, I will only talk about the infinite depth case to avoid a, a lot of algebra. Um, <clears throat> Our proof is so our proof is quite different, and it is more uh, compatible with energy estimates for the nonlinear pro for the nonlinear problem, and we think it will lead to a proof of the nonlinear instability also, which we're working on right now. Hui, Hui, Nguyen, and I, and I. Okay, <clears throat> here's a more careful statement of the main result. So we take a Stokes what a Stokes wave of period two pi, say, and its amplitude is epsilon. Epsilon will be small. And mu is a perturbation of the wave number. That means you take e to the i mu x and you multiply everything by e to the i mu x. And then we look at how it evolves in time. And then you get a linearized operator, which I will write down very carefully later. And um, we show this is linearized instability. So we say that if epsilon is small and mu is small, even depending on epsilon, then the linearized operator has an eigenvalue with a positive real part. Here's the real part. This part is imaginary. Here's the real part, small positive real part. And therefore, um, the time behavior of the solution will look, look like E 
to the lambda t. And our result is consistent with numer uh, various numerics, uh, but particularly there's numerics of De Conic and Oliveras, um, which I took this picture from them, um, which um, this is the curve as a function of mu. The curve, this is in the complex plane. Uh, here's the real part in this way, and it's, it's consistent. Notice that the, it's a very, very flat curve. This um, figure eight curve is very flat. You notice the scale here on the x-axis. So <clears throat> to prove, to do our proof, we begin with a Stokes wave. We linearize. We have to be very careful how we do that. And then we transform to a fixed domain and get uh, a linearized operator on a fixed domain. So here we start the formulation. So we're going to use the Zakharov Craig Sulem formulation of water waves, which is which is written in red here for equation four. I've just re repeated equation three. <clears throat> the point is that um, you take the um, velocity potential and you restrict it to the boundary that's here, and you call that psi. We call it psi here, and then we have. Eta is the, is the function giving the surface. Psi is the velocity potential on the surface. And you get these two equations. It's completely equivalent to the above. <clears throat> and um, these are equations on the surface. And G of eta is the Dirichlet Neumann operator, which takes you from Dirichlet conditions on the surface, F, to Neumann condition, so Neumann data. Okay. So back in 100 years ago, the theorem Nekrasov and levi civita proved, as I said before, there is a nice curve of smooth traveling waves. Um, at least they're small, a nice little curve, and <coughs> Stokes, uh, this is the Stokes expansion, which he had done many decades earlier, which is correct. And we're going to use this expansion. Okay. So we start with the Stokes wave, and now we linearize. So I'll use an asterisk for the Stokes, for things related to the Stokes wave. This is the speed, and these are the two variables. And you have to um, linearize the, this combination, Dirichlet-Neumann operator acting on psi. And to do that, we use David Lund's shape derivative formula, and which is not so trivial. So it's convenient. OK, so that just says how you linearize such a term, which occurs in the equation. <coughs> In, in terms of B star and V star, which I define here. And we also introduce Alignac's so-called good unknown, which is this combination. A to, the bar means the linearized direction. And then our system becomes a system in red in terms of V1 and V2. It takes this form, which is rather nice. And let's assume it acts on some functions of some period L. OK, this is still, the surface is still variable. But if we use a conformal mapping, which is a well-known technique, then we map the fluid domain, which is still an unknown domain, into a rectangle. And if we do that, then, and we make the appropriate definitions, <clears throat> then we get this, this, this system. Then the system I said before, the linearized system, takes the form 8 and 9, <clears throat> which is very nice because it just has a couple of variable coefficients occurring in altogether three places 
which depend on the Stokes, <coughs> the small Stokes wave. And here you have a pseudo differential operator, which is just the standard one. Okay, so here you have a linear, this is the linear problem. This is what we will study. And here's the Stokes expansion again. Okay, so that's what you want to work on. And now we introduce the Floquet parameter mu, which is which changes the wave number. And mu is going to be small. And lambda is the eigenvalue. Well, well, lambda is the growth in time, which will also be small. So, whoops, what happened? Uh, whoops. Here. Um, <coughs> also small. But, okay, we are going to look for, so WJ is the solution that we had right here, W1, W2, a pair. And now we make this change of variables. And we look, for W will not have period 2 pi, but we look for U's, which are period 2 pi. Whoops, I did it again. Um, <coughs> Okay, so we stick that in. And if we choose mu to be a rational number, then w's are, have, have some period, L, which is n0 times 2 pi. Uh, so that's a convenient way to look at things. Um, we don't need the block transform to do this. Um, and, and then when we make this change of variables, we get a set of equations for U1 and U2. Here's the equations for U1 and U2. Capital U is the pair, U1, U2, and here's the equation. So here we have, in, I've emphasized in, in red color, the, um, the linearized operator. And of course, the time behavior here, the D by DT becomes lambda times u. So this becomes an eigenvalue problem. And we're looking for lambda with the real part, which is positive. And this acts on functions of period 2 pi, of pairs. These are, this is a pair here. So this is what we're going to be working with. And let's look at this operator L mu epsilon. <clears throat> um, well, here's the theorem even, again, stated slightly more carefully now. Um, epsilon is the smallness of the Stokes wave. Mu is the Floquet parameter. And it says that if they're both small, then, they're, then here's the eigenvalue. And here's the real part. And the hard work is to find such an eigenvalue. I think this is the deeper than the nonlinear problem, honestly. This, you have to do this before you could even consider the nonlinear instability. OK, so let's look at the spectrum. Well, it's really easy when epsilon is 0. Remember, oh, the, the, here's the linearized operator in red. And now I took, now I take um, epsilon equals zero, which means the, these coefficients, p star and m star, are just constants. And it, it's just this. This is what happens when epsilon equals zero. Oops. There, right here. And you can just Fourier transform, and you see exactly what the, what the eigenvalues are. They're all imaginary. All the eigenvalues are imaginary. And, and mu is small for us. And four, four of these eigenvalues, of these guys here, are near zero. Four of them are near zero, but they're on the imaginary axis above, just above and below the origin. Now, when, when both epsilon is zero and mu is zero, then these four coalesce 
or you might say collide at the origin and you get um, a very simple and even simpler matrix with an zero as an eigenvalue of multiplicity four. But now we're going to let epsilon be non-zero. If we let epsilon be non-zero, but mu equals zero, then you still have zero, then you still have zero, the, uh, the null space still has a multiplicity four. It's a four-dimensional null space. And here are the eigenvectors. Two eigenvectors, two actual eigenvectors. Uh, these are pairs, I've written the pairs horizontally. And two generalized eigenvectors. So that means that um, here they are explicitly, they, they, they come from invariance of the equation when, when mu equals zero. So this is mu equals zero case. And, and here, the two generalized eigenvectors, it just means that L of U is not zero, but equals to one of the other eigenvectors. And it turns out it's important to normalize, uh, change U2 tilde to U2, which you change it by a constant for technical say. Um, <clears throat> and here are the expansions. So it comes from S Stokes and then we keep expanding and, and U2, U3, U4 are, are um, given, have these expansions in epsilon. U1 is just vector zero one. Okay, so that's when mu equals zero. Now we want mu not equal zero. Because we only have, so far we've only had imaginary eigenvalues. And we want real, we want a real part. So we use the Lyapunov-Schmidt method. We split into its four-dimensional kernel and an infinite dimensional other part. And by pi, it's the projection on the infinite dimensional part. So here, 18 is the infinite dimensional equation. 19 is four scalar equations. <clears throat> and then we look for a solution, which is the kernel plus some W. W solves the infinite dimensional equation. 20 is the same as 18, essentially. Okay. so. Um, okay, so here again, I've just repeated uh, what the linearized operator is, and it decomposes into, as a function of mu, you see, it's just linear here, and it's almost linear here, um, but if you, we have to be a little careful about, about this, when you expand this in, ups, in mu's, but it's there's no mu squared term here, turns out. Okay, so, so just split, split L into these two parts. And now, and now we, um, we, um, we, we substitute this into, into the previous equation at the bottom of the page into the previous equation. And then you can write it in the following form. Um, then the equation for W now takes this form, the bottom of the page. And you see W occurs on the left side and then there's stuff on the right side, which is known. U, the UJs are the, those things in the kernel, which are explicit. Pi is this projection. And we, to find WJ, we have to invert this guy and we can and we do invert this guy and we call that we're going to call that by we'll call it capital c and we notice that this part this coefficient here mu and lambda small so when we invert this guy we can also think of this as a small perturbation okay <clears throat> 
Therefore, okay, so we can invert it. We show that we can invert it. That's not, not so hard. Um, and we call the inverse C, C epsilon. And then, and then because of the mu and lambda small, we can write the Neumann series and we get this formal formula for W, W1, W2, uh, given this way. Um, so we call the W sideband functions because they come from the sideband mu, you might say. <clears throat> the Ws turn out to be very important rather than just error terms. Okay. <clears throat> so remember that was the definition of U. This is just some unknown linear combination here. Uh, we look for a solution. Uh, we look, we're looking for an eigenvector where the eigenvalue is lambda. Oh, we, so when we write, we simply put that into 19. So 19 was the four dimensional guy. So here's the four dimensional guy written. The W's are given by the previous equation formally. And, um, and when we put that, the four equations, um, this is a vector equation, depend on these four scalars, which are still unknown. So it, <clears throat> we wanna know whether you have a, uh, for, this, is, this is four equations in four, in four unknowns, alpha one to alpha four. And we wanna know whether it has a non-trivial solution and we wanna find what lambda is. So it has a non-trivial solution if and only if the determinant is zero. Uh, it's a linear problem. Okay, so, and here, well, so I've written out what uh, the matrix A, four by four matrix A and the matrix B and the matrix I, I is almost the identity. <clears throat> um, matrix A is basically L U comma U that four by four matrix and B is essentially L W comma U. Okay, but it's obviously it's gonna be complicated. We're gonna use expansions everywhere. Okay, so we're, we're, look, we're solving this equation, determinant equals zero. We wanna find lambda with a positive real part. And now, um, we expand. So this lemma, <clears throat> in this lemma, I've expanded A and I've left out a, a lot of algebra. So um, if we neglect the, the, if we just look at the A part, see, we really want to do the equation in the top in the box. <clears throat> but if we just neglect B, which is the sideband matrix, then we can write down what the expansion of the determinant is in terms of mu, in powers of mu and powers of epsilon. So notice that the leading term, these are all, all these terms in black have higher powers of epsilon and mu and lambda, but the, uh, or at least in epsilon, yeah. But the first term is this one. But if we just look if we set this equal to zero, this blue guy, we're gonna get lambda equal one half i mu, which is imaginary again, not good enough. So, so now then we do another long calculation. These are long detailed calculations, but relatively elementary, but there are many of them. <clears throat> we look at the part, this is the one we really want, and we look at the difference between that and the determinant with b equals zero. And then we get this term. That's really the key calculation right here. We get this term. Notice this is real and negative. And we get these other terms, which have powers of epsilon and mu and so on. <clears throat> when we combine the two lemmas, we get, we get the expansion for this determinant. There's this determinant. 
and here it is. This is the term we had from the A part, and this is the extra term, which I've written in red, we get from the, from the B part. And <clears throat> now we have to look at this and how all these, all these things are important. Um, the important thing here is that you have this combination here and here, even though they're, they just have like a mu here and a mu squared, but which isn't such a high power, but okay. <clears throat> and then you have, well, another term here. Okay. Um, and okay, he, uh, okay, let me go on to them. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. <clears throat> For small epsilon mu and lambda. R1 and R2 are just some complex constants. Um, okay, so, oh, notice, I guess I should go back. Notice that this is, most of these terms are cubic in the pair mu lambda. This is cubic. This is cubic, oops. This is cubic. This is cubic in the pair. This is also cubic in the pair. And this, I, I haven't written it out, but it's also cubic in the pair. And this thing doesn't depend, does not depend on mu or lambda, it only depends on epsilon. And then we get an, a really junky term here, but it's of high order, order fourth power. <clears throat> okay, so because all those terms are cubic, we can make this little change of variables and just scale it. And gamma is what we're calling the ratio. <clears throat> and if we, and then we can factor out mu cubed out of all the terms except the last one. Um, okay, there's a, okay. Uh, yeah, let me see. I, I, if I, I'm skipping the last term for the time being. Um, okay, let's skip the last term. So <clears throat> then you, you get rid of mu and lambda, you just have gamma. And here it is, here's the, here's the part which we'll give imaginary. Here's the, the really important term right here. And here's these other two terms. And then we got some other terms here. This and this, okay. Okay, yeah, that's right. So now I write it, <clears throat> the last term can depend on all the variables in some complicated way, but it's of high order. <clears throat> so I just treat that separately, but let's look at all the rest of it. All the terms except the last one are, are called Q tilde. And now you can actually see easily, just look, look at the first two terms here, which are in color. You look at the first two terms and you solve for gamma. Then you have gamma equals I over two plus the square root of epsilon squared one over eight exactly that. And then the other terms we, we can handle, we can handle by, by um, uh, we use the implicit function theorem. So we get for the, for the Q tilde part, we get I over two plus epsilon times something, some smooth guy, which at epsilon equals zero is one over the square root of eight. So that's, that's the Q tilde part. I'm on, almost at the end of the proof here. <clears throat> so now the actual polynomial we want to solve is this one, is the Q tilde plus this last term, but the last term is a very high order. Uh, that means very small, high, high power of mu. And, um, and okay, so, so the, um, so now you just use the implicit function theorem. So the last step, you use the implicit function theorem to handle this guy. And you still get um, a pair of real roots, one positive, one negative. Uh, here's the plus, okay. And so you end up with, with this, uh, one positive, one negative here, um, with a real part positive and another one with a part negative. 
and it comes off the imaginary axis. And then you have higher order terms. These are smooth guys. So that's, that's the proof. So I wanted to give you the proof of this theorem. And um, as I said, it also works with finite depth, but then you have a lot of hyperbolic tangents and a lot of algebra, but the same thing works, same idea. Uh, thank you very much.